Hey guys, did you know that I have a Patreon where you can support me and plus get awesome rewards? Or if you're thinking to yourself, but Julian, I want even more bang for my buck while still supporting you, you can pop over to my Redbubble and check out my awesome store with new designs appearing regularly. But for now, enjoy the video you're about to watch. Before we begin this read-along, I feel I should let you all know that I very much enjoy Jenna Moresi's channel and all of her writing advice. I love her personality and her style. She's great. However, I am going to be very critical of her book and I'm going to be incredibly honest. And if you are one of those people who cannot stand to see one of your favorite things torn apart, I really highly recommend that you just don't watch this video. You can still watch it if you want, but I am going to be reading critically and I am going to be pointing out places where I feel like Jenna has really dropped the ball in her writing. So you've all been warned. Also there are going to be all of the spoilers, every single spoiler. Don't go into this if you don't want spoilers. Thank you and enjoy the video. Hey guys, it's me, Julian Greystoke and Kinshu. And I just randomly decided to do this thing because I've been thinking about it and I know all of you are very, very excited for me to read Jenna Moresi's latest book, The Savior's Champion, and you're all champing at the bit for a review of it. But it's gonna be a minute because it takes me a really long time to just read a book, like a big old chunky book. Normally I took the dust cover off because it was slippery. So what I decided to do is something I don't normally do, which is sort of a, a vlog where you just hang out with me while I read and I give you a blow by blow my thoughts in the minute as they are happening. And we'll see how that goes and maybe I'll do a classic review after that, but this way I don't have to keep taking notes, I can just turn to the camera and say what I'm thinking and you all can join me in this fantastical journey. Now you've probably noticed this, but the lighting in my living room is shit. I'm covered in cats. Uh, I'm not gonna obviously be able to do this in a single day, not even close, so you're going to have to deal with me being in different clothes, sometimes in my work clothes, never in makeup, because I don't wear makeup during the day. I have like a menial uh, blue collar job, guys. I don't wear makeup to that. But I am actually a little ways through this book already. Oh, I'm on chapter four. I've already got a couple of tabs in, so we're going to talk about the notes that I already have from what I have previously read, just so we can be caught up. The big thing that I have noticed right away is this sort of world building 101 thing. Like, this is a very basic world building thing that pretty much everyone will tell you. Use of the way people talk in the world really helps with the world building and it's something that you don't always think about and a lot of the characters say god god damn it or whatever and this in this world they don't seem to at least yet have any kind of god besides the savior world building 101 if they don't believe in a god they wouldn't use that to swear they it wouldn't be part of their vocabulary and it wouldn't be hard to change it. It wouldn't be hard to say, have them say, save your damn it, or whatever. But that, that was a big one that I noticed right away, is that the language, is, as part of the world building, is kind of neglected. God rest their souls, they say, why not save your rest their souls? It's pretty easy. Uh, Jenna loves italics. We talked about this in my review of Eve the Awakening. She loves italics, and at first it seemed like they were toned down, but the further I got in this book, the more and more they showed up. And the thing about italics is, like, I don't have a problem with using them occasionally, but the thing is, the more you use them, the more people start to tune them out, and then they're not serving their purpose. And it's kind of insulting to the reader because it implies to the reader that they don't know what words they should emphasize in a sentence, and... I just, I wish she didn't do it so much. Something that I was noticing at the beginning of the book and then it kind of went away a little bit and we'll see if it comes back when people are really talking to each other again, is that everybody kind of talks with Jenna's voice. If you watch her videos, she has like not only a cadence but a vocabulary and all of the characters kind of share that same one. 
And having distinct voices for your characters, especially in an ensemble piece, like I think this is going to turn out to be, is crucial. We'll see how that turns out. It's early days yet. My computer is right here, so if you hear Facebook nonsense, that's why. I was confused by the sister, because his sister has a spinal injury, which I will admit is pretty well done because Jenna does have that experience with her fiancé, is he now? Cliff? Who's a delightful person. Um, and his spinal injury, and so she has the experience to write a character with a spinal injury realistically. That's great. But I don't understand Tobias. It's like, oh, my sister can never marry and she can never have kids. Okay, well, maybe she can never have kids. Maybe that's a fact. But never marry? His friend Milo, like, his Milo's first lines are proposing to the sister. And if they are a... If those lines are a joke, they're kind of a mean joke. And Milo doesn't seem like he's being mean to her. So I think that she could marry, unless there are laws against marrying people with disabilities in their land that I don't know about. I see no reason why she could not marry and adopt children or something. And also, Tobias, marriage and kids don't equal a happy life. Tobias is super worried about his sister and then spends the whole day in town with his bro. Bro meaning bestie, not bro meaning he has a brother. I'm kind of unclear, I have written down, I'm unclear why Tobias thinks money from the tournament will solve everything. Like, sure, his sister and mom could have a nicer house and better food, but it's not gonna, like, cure his sister's spinal injury unless the rich people have some really powerful medicines that are never brought up. Tobias really doesn't want to enter the tournament, and then he's supposed to have, like, this switch where he's like, oh, my sister's in pain and we live such a shitty life. But I'm really not feeling that desperation when he goes in and decides to enter the tournament. Like, I need it to be a lot more visceral. A, a concrete, like, we could have the very best medicine if I enter the tournament. It's not clear to me, like, what exactly him entering the tournament would gain his family, other than this sort of amorphous they'll live slightly better than they are now. The measurement scene, I did enjoy it. Uh, it was pretty snappy and cute. A little bit clunky at times as a way to like describe Tobias physically, but it was cute. The book straight up admits that the labyrinth is just a tunnel. And that's a critique that I have seen a lot of other people having, is that it's called a labyrinth, but it's just a tunnel. And for me, that wouldn't even be such a big problem if labyrinth wasn't used in the marketing and like even on the cover blurb because labyrinth means a certain thing to people and it's sort of like false advertising when it turns out to just be a tunnel full of traps. I don't know, maybe it's gonna get more labyrinthy. I haven't gotten all the way through the book yet so it might change but right now it's just a tunnel and that's not a labyrinth. Tobias gets into this tournament really fucking easily. It's almost like they were waiting for him specifically. Because he showed up late, he gets his cock measured, and then he's in. And it's like, were they just waiting for the right size dick? What? Okay, now we're on to the vines scene. Um, the way it was written was confusing. I imagine them, like, grabbing onto the vines on the walls and, like, holding on and, like, shimmying along. But apparently they were swinging, like, frickin'... Like frickin' that old video game, I wrote it down, what was it? Oh, Pitfall? That's apparently what they were doing, and that seems much less efficient and safe to me than just shimmying along the walls. I don't I was confused. It was confusing. And of course they just threw these people straight into this labyrinth without any preparation. They're just like, go! Which, I mean, I guess you want to get straight to the action, but it seemed a little like, meh? And again, another common complaint is what are the spectators supposed to do while everybody's down in a tunnel where they can't be seen? Like, another disadvantage of throwing these people straight into the labyrinth is that the spectators that came to see them are now just, like, supposed to go home? Once again, and I'm gonna have to see how this goes, there are a lot of characters in this story, and I know in Eve the Awakening, Jenna's characterization was one of the weakest things. She tends to have characters that are evil, just being very one-dimensionally evil, characters that are good being very one-dimensionally good, aside from like the token Krabby Pants character who is kind of based on herself. Uh, so we'll see, but so far we've established the people we're not supposed to like in the broadest strokes possible, like extreme violence and sexism. and. I, I can hope that they eventually have depth, but I have a feeling that it's just going to be these people bad, these people good, nary the twain shall meet. 
And then my last note for for the section I got to, because I just got to the part where they got to like their sanctuary, their camp in the labyrinth. I'm gonna keep doing this for labyrinth. Kaleo, I think, uh, he likes to kill people, and no one seems inclined to stop him. So I'm very confused why he doesn't just kill at least everyone he perceives to be as weak, like immediately. Because nobody gives a fuck. And then Toby like attacks him, and he doesn't kill him. Even though he's very easily killed everyone else that has even looked at him funny or annoyed him slightly. And the book gives you a very tenuous, like, or somebody tells him to stop and he's like, I'll get you later, Tobias. But it didn't convince me that he wouldn't have just killed Tobias by smashing his head into the nearest wall. So those are my thoughts so far, and now I guess I'm gonna do a little reading and you can join me and we'll just discuss this book as it goes along. What have I got tabbed? What have I got tabbed? Awkward sentences, I think. Let's see. Trying to slow its ascent through sheer will of his thoughts, but surprisingly nothing happened. Yeah, that is a little bit awkward. He glanced at the sun, trying to slow its ascent through sheer will of his thoughts, but surprisingly nothing happened. So sheer will of his thoughts, I think, is part of why I found it so awkward, because can your thoughts have will? And also, surprisingly nothing happened. He is surprised surprised that the sun didn't stop. His body eventually slowed, leaving him to dangle aimlessly. Yeah, I don't know, I'm not entirely certain how you dangle aimlessly. Whatever. Let's get reading. Uh, let's get reading. <laughs> okay, so they get this instruction that says, to the front. And then the tunnel they're in begins to flood. And there's literally like a door right in front of them, apparently. And everyone, as the tunnel starts to flood, everyone's like, What are we gonna do? What do we do? Oh no! There's a door right in front of you. Go try it? Like, that would be thing one that I would try. Like, when I saw to the front, I would have been like charging across the room to be in the lead of all these other people. So, these guys are dumb. These guys are dumb. They're like, I can't swim. And it's like, you haven't even tried the door. You dumbass panic then. I do wonder how Tobias knows how to swim. Does that come up much in his daily life? He was an artist and then he worked in uh, like a sugar cane farm. When did he learn to swim? Oh my gosh. <laughs> These people all deserve to die in this tunnel, because Tobias is apparently the only one who's even noticed that the door opposite them has, like, a wheel on it to turn and open. Yeah, that doesn't work. They're all, they're all in the water that is so deep that it's almost to the ceiling and they can barely, like, get breath, and it says, The other men waded in clusters. Nope. <laughs> oh my gosh, these people are so dumb! Let me just... He dove toward the floor, hellbent on survival. Other men congregated by the door, pounding at it. But Tobias glided past them, dropping down be beside the Cetus, I don't know how to pronounce his name, who was the only other guy trying the wheel. Their eyes locked, forming an unspoken agreement, and together they pulled. Really, these are the only two people who thought to try this wheel. You all deserve to drown. I'm curious if this labyrinth, aka the very, 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 very long tunnel, is actually as long as it seems, or whether magic is like just looping them back on themselves, or what. Because it is, if it is as long as it seems, that is like, where are they? Are they gonna be like walking into other countries at some point here? It's gonna be really hard to keep track of them. I feel like I'm reading a D&D game with all of these traps and everything. Here's another redundancy that I noticed um, Jenna likes to use, and a lot of writers use this, this isn't just her. This is just something that I've been trying to eliminate in my own writing, so I noticed it. Um, this guy called The Brave has taken the lead in this uh, stepstone puzzle, and uh, he's already stepped out onto the puzzle, and, and it says The Brave took another step forward. You don't need the word forward, you can just say took another step. Forward is implied. The only time you would need to tell us which direction he was stepping at this point is if he stepped backward or side to side, some unexpected direction. Otherwise, forward 
is expected. You don't need it. That's just a little, little tiny nitpick pro tip for all of us writers out there. So Jenna is working really, really hard to make us hate this Kaleo guy, and I'm kind of zoning out, because after a while, if you make a character, like, so hateful, I get kind of desensitized to it, but she's trying really hard. Somebody else died, and I don't care. It was the guy who helped, the only other guy who was smart enough to turn the thing this really is a D&D game. Uh, even better, this is like a LARPing game. Uh, they have come to this place where essentially it's like a laser maze but with ribbons. So they have to like get around the, the lasers. Um, maybe maze isn't the right word. Laser challenge, whatever. And we've done this. I, I LARP, fun fact. And uh, this is an obstacle that we have made, a, a, a spider's web, where we have a couple of trees and we put rope across and people have to like slither through. This is exactly that. And just it's just adding to my feeling of reading a D&D &D, uh, module of some kind. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's not entertaining. It's just a feeling that I have. I'm curious why Drake gets to have a name while everybody else pretty much always get has their laurels. Why isn't it the prince met the dragon's gaze with a challenging glare instead of the prince met Drake's gaze with a challenging glare? I don't understand why sometimes we use their laurels and sometimes we don't. I don't understand why Tobias is helping this guy. Uh, the, the prince um, is now been shot and Tobias is helping him for reasons. I guess because he's a good guy and that's a thing that good guys do. Sure. And they uh, make it out of this ribbon maze which is supposed to be very complicated at this end of it while he's like basically dragging a guy so that's a thing isn't one of them like doesn't one of them have the laurel of like the physician or something like that or did he die oh no he's still here apparently he's just a fuckface so uh... the romantic interest shows up and she's a healer and 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 so Tobias is like help this guy out and uh, she's like, "Here's uh, he's your competition, yet you save his life. Why? And I'm like, same girl. I don't know. Yeah, like, bodies were piling up around him, leaving him with a single objective. Don't become one of them. If that's your single objective, why are you helping this other guy? Because he, you could have been made one of them by helping this guy, Tobias. What are your priorities, my dude? I know we're supposed to understand that Tobias is a good guy and we should look at his actions to see that he is a good guy, but at the same time, like, we should understand his motivation for wanting to help this guy. Sorry, my camera focus keeps going in and out. Remember, this is a super informal video. Okay, so I read a chapter and I think I'm going to stop because I have other things to do, but we'll catch back up probably tomorrow or whenever and we'll just keep doing this until we make it through this big-ass book. That sounds exciting, right? The next chapter is called First Impressions. Or the first impressions. So that's a thing. Hey everyone, it is shout out time, and I have another new patron to shout out for you. As you know, for the first time, I always do a special shout out. Our new patron is Amanda, and Amanda is another booktuber, so please go check out her channel, linked in the doobly-doo. I love watching her videos, I've been following her for a while, so definitely go check her out on my recommendation. She's a really great person and I love her work. And of course, a shout out to my other patrons, Kim, Sarah, Sabby Panda, and Lisa. You guys still rock, and if you want to be awesome like these great people, then become my patron over on Patreon.